Hey everyone, welcome back to OTD Military History. Uh, so, just a quick update about myself. Yesterday, I was taking my dog out for a walk, and I live in Ottawa, and we've got lots of cold and snow and ice. So, I was trying to hold him, because he, he just had surgery himself, so I don't want him thrashing around, that kind of thing. Went to step on the ice, on the ground, on the uh, sidewalk, hit, hit the ground pretty hard. So, my ribs are, are, are bugging me, so if I don't see myself, or you hear some weird breathing noises. It's me. <laughs> so, um, but we're still going to go through. Um, and uh, so today we're going to be talking with one of our own, Chris, Chris Cranfield. It's on the sidebar all the time, which is always great to have support. Uh, so we're going to talk about his first book uh, about the Archer. And I'm going to let him take all of that over because I only know really the parts of the reports and things he shared with me earlier and the parts of the book that I edited. So, um, and clearly, I, you guys know I'm not the tech guy, and that, that's why Chris is here. So we're going to be talking about it, and it's his first book. So for questions-wise, um, ask away as we go through, and we're going to try and bunch some questions together as we move through to kind of break it up. So if you have questions, uh, fire away, and, and don't wait to the end. But uh, this will be a good one, because uh, me and Chris have been talking about this one for quite some time. So thanks, Chris, for, for coming on the channel. Uh, finally Thank glad you very much, Brad. The, the book done. <laughs> yep, yep. And, uh, have a proof copy to look at myself, which is awesome. And uh, yeah, to see it all finished up because I mean we've been talking about this for I don't know how long. <laughs> it's been a couple of years, right? Uh, I, I I I wanted to um, make sure to like what's the acknowledge whatever uh, that uh, I'm a I'm one of your patrons. Oh right, right, and, right, right. and as part of that. Here, here's a here's a plug, Brad. Um, I got I got Brad to review a couple of the chapters from my book and provide some commentary, which I think really did improve them, uh, and so that was really helpful. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so it's, it's a nice day here in Toronto. Uh, not really much snow, for, unfortunately for us, no ice. <laughs> but anyway, show off. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I... Busted up my ribs before, so this is nothing new for me, but it just sucks mm. being older now. So you don't feel like you used to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, I think I've asked you this before and we've talked about it, but not in a public forum. Right. Um, I don't really remember. Well, I, I know the answer, but I, I want to talk about it a little more in detail. Um, sure. Why the Archer? <laughs> right. I mean, it's it's just, how do I say this? So late to the game is the best mm -hmm. way I can think about this now with this, with this pain. It, it just it, it doesn't come up much because it's it's later. I'm not saying it doesn't have an importance or it's well adapted for the role that it's even adapted to. Sorry, that's eventually used for. But mm -hmm. you know, this stuff you usually hear about on the German side of all the weird little kit that gets you know used for an afternoon. Yeah, or oh, well, we, we built, the Germans there. built two of this vehicle, and so they decided to send it to the Eastern Front and got you got used all the time, and it's like. Two really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. I mean, so why why this allied self propelled gun? This one particularly. Right. Well, I mean, I am as a Canadian. I mean, I'm just I feel much more interested in researching the Allied side of things than the German side of things. Um, and how this came about was initially just as sort of a hobby. I got into doing research at the National Archives, uh, and then. I had the opportunity to develop a relationship with a researcher in the UK who would research photograph could photograph things for me. He was because he was interested in me photographing documents for him. Right. And so that I, all of a sudden I got this opp amazing opportunity. It's like I could write about anything. I've got somebody who can go to the archives for me in London. I don't have to fly over there or anything to do it. <laughs> yeah. And so then I thought, well, okay, what am I gonna do with this? Uh, and I hadn't hadn't really didn't have a good idea. Uh, and then I was coming back home to Toronto from one of my little research trips to the archives. And it just came out of a bolt of the blue that nobody had ever written a book about the Archer before. And it was basically just that. It's just like, yes, it's a, a vehicle that only kind of serves in the last, to a, to a large extent in the last six months of the war. Yeah. Um, but it's a little, little gap in, I don't know, <laughs> can I actually say the historiography? I'm not a historian, but... No, um, yeah. Well, you a, are. There's, a, there's, a, there's a little gap there, so there's something new that I can do. Some documents, so, you know, it's just going to be some research where maybe one at the end of it, all of this was just like six years ago or something. There'll be a book where somebody can read this and they'll be learning something new. Because personally, like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't mind reading about the same, like, events a couple of times, but I don't, yeah. I'm not really, like, interested in reading, like, the same, about the same stuff 12 times. I'm always 
there's so many different facets to the, to the war yeah. and it's always interesting to read something new so uh, that's sort of a personal self-motivation yeah. for me well as well you know dave patterson i mean <laughs> that's a good point actually yes I mean, great. it's uh it's got that bit of the weird i'll just say weird factor um, sure yep i like it um, because like again we joke especially on this channel but in a sort of serious way right the allies can crank out stuff Mm -hmm. in huge quantities, which is a good thing in total war, world war. So this is why I think it's uh, uh, really cool. And Alex says that I agree with you. You are a historian because you're filling a, a gap in the literature. So you're making an actual contribution. Yeah, but I'm not trained. So I'm not I trained. Matter. I know people who are trained and shouldn't be historians. So <laughs> I'm not going to say anything more about them. But so it's it, that's cool. So uh, we've got uh, quite a good presentation or slideshow um, going for today. So uh, tell me when you want to move through, Chris, and uh, okay. we'll get started. Sure. Okay. Well, um, I didn't really plan anything for this slide, but let me just talk about this photograph. So that's sure. an archer. Um, this photograph was taken in Newcastle on Tyne at the Ellswick factory owned by Vickers Armstrong, where the vehicle was made. Um, we're looking at it from the rear. I don't know whether the, um, the building in the rear is actually the building where they made them. But um, right. I think that's everything there is really to say uh, about this photograph. So yeah, we can go to the next slide. That's a cool picture, actually. Uh, yeah, that's quite yeah, nice. Right now I'm looking at it. It's it's backwards, but not backwards. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So uh, wait, wait. There should be a slide before this one. That's all I got, Chris. Um. Do you want to take this one off and you can share a new... Uh, yeah, maybe screen. maybe we've got the wrong... I've shared the wrong thing with you here. I'll remove it and take it off and then redo it. So real quick, I'll just keep everyone distracted. Um, <laughs> what are we saying? Yeah, so, oh, talk about weather. Yes, weather is always an important one. And it sounds like uh, Andreas in Germany has nice weather. So very, very jealous. Um, yeah, so, uh, well... I can talk about what Chris was talking about there, just with the Patreon stuff. So if, if any of you are a patron or, or are interested in it, um, I, I'll do research help for you. Um, depending on the level, I can give you like free hours and all that stuff. If you want to check that out, it's linked down below. Also is um, Chris's book. It's linked down below where to get it. Uh, and that's about the only things I have linked down there um, because I want to keep this one short, trying something different for the, the algorithm. Um, anyway, so... Uh, We'll try and I see it again. Is this the new one, Chris? It should be. All righty. There so, we go. Yes. Okay, here we go. Good, good, good. All right. So I just wanted to say to, a little bit to begin with about anti-tank guns, and these are British anti-tank guns in particular, um, because uh, anti-tank guns are a facet of the war that doesn't get talked about that much, but the story of the archer is really uh, linked in with them, so we need to address it to some extent. So... Yeah. Each of the different nations, the Germans, the Russians, the British, uh, Americans, all had anti-tank guns. Uh, those might actually be mounted in tanks, um, or they could be uh, deployed on the ground like the ones we see here. So like the one on the left there is the one that the British started the war with, the two-pounder gun, and it was also used in the early British tanks uh, of that period. And yep. then the one on the right is the six-pounder gun, uh, which was a bit larger. Um, and um, one of the issues that the British had with de like deploying, putting their anti-tank guns into production was mm -hmm. that after the fall of France, so we all know about Dunkirk and it was, it was amazing, a miracle that so many men got saved, yeah. but a lot of equipment was left behind um, in France, including lots of anti-tank guns. And so that put the British in a bit of a bind where they were worried about uh, they had the six-pounder designed. They wanted to put it into production, but they were worried that if they took factories offline for the time it took to retool them, that mm. they'd, be, they'd be losing anti-tank guns that they needed to deploy to the war in North Africa. So yep. that that delayed the introduction of the six-pounder. Um, right. But uh, if we go to the next slide, by 1942, they designed the 17-pounder anti-tank gun. So this is, again, a much bigger gun. So we've got the two-pounder because... The shells weighed two pounds, the six pounder the same. So that's three times heavier. And then the 17 pounder, almost three times heavier again. Um, yep. And just a much, much bigger gun. Uh, next slide, please. 
Yeah, it's uh, for because I'm going to jump in as you know, Chris. But mm -hmm. for those who haven't seen it, it, it is much larger than the six pounder. I mean, the Canadian War Museum has them, I think, next to each other, and the size difference is just it's uh, yeah, <laughs> it's quite remarkable. Uh, Andreas, uh, 17 pounder is 76 millimeters, yeah, 76 and a half, yeah, okay. So now we get to the origin of the archer. So in 1942, although things are going at that moment very badly for the British, really overall, uh, the war in North Africa is not going well. You know what the things that went on in the Pacific, 1942, the, ja the Japanese are kind of all over the place. Right. Um, but the Americans have joined the war, which is obviously gonna be hugely important. Um, and they were developing something that they called the M10, or initially the T35, based on the Sherman, which was going to be field, fielded to their anti-tank forces, which they called the tank destroyer branch. Uh, and you can see a picture of one of those there. Um, now the British, so as I said, the British needed a self-propelled gun for the 17 pounder. And so their main plan was to order these M10s and then they planned to switch the guns out for the 17 pounder. However, they were worried that maybe the Americans aren't going to be able to actually supply us with all the guns we need, all the vehicles we need. So they wanted a, a British design as a backup. Um, so next slide. Right, so they had limited design objectives. Um, the vehicles were not intended to be a rapid deployment force, which was what the Americans were thinking about. The American thought was, oh, if there's menacing German tanks in one area, we'll rush a big group of anti-tank guns in, in vehicles over to, to counter them. But for the British, it was really just a matter of moving the guns more quickly, as I wrote here, from A to B, particularly to, to keep up with tanks, that uh, allied tanks. Um, and because they'd been fighting in North Africa, what they, the anti-tank gun, gunners experienced was that if they were spotted, they got attacked by everything. Uh, enemy tanks, enemy infantry, enemy aircraft, enemy artillery. So, um, so the priority then was um, for them to be small and hard to see. Uh, from a production point of view, uh, the general staff wanted to use existing chassis because they didn't want to have to like reinvent the wheel to, to, to put one of these things into production. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So one of the things that was proposed was uh, an anti-tank gun or self-propelled anti-tank gun based on the Crusader. And so we've got this sideways drawing here where they've basically taken off the turret and they put the 17 pounder gun there but the big problem there are two big problems with this one is that the gun itself is just way too high off the ground and the other is that all the crew have for protection is a gun shield so for both of those reasons it was rejected as just not fit for purpose yeah even the picture looks gigantic <laughs> right okay so next slide so another proposal which came from Vickers armstrong was based on their valentine tank uh and now you can see a valentine tank that was made in montreal uh, in the photograph on the left. And on the right, we have a prototype archer. Um, now, uh, the overall design used as many of the components as possible from the Valentine tank. Right. The most vis visually obvious thing um, in these photographs are the wheels, uh, the suspension system. So you can see it's got like larger, like a an either wheel and a sprocket which are kind of raised off the ground. And then it's got those distinctive triplets of wheels with one of them larger uh, and two of those. Um, and also the engine was basically a very similar model and so on. Uh, but they've taken off the turret. Uh, the, it was not constructed to the same armor standards. They didn't take a Valentine tank and just like swap out the turret. It was essentially a new design, uh, but based on like, well, we've got basically the same chassis, slightly lengthened, less armor, um, a new, uh, fighting compartment for the crew and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a really helpful top view. Um, I'm always amused by looking at this. Uh, I've, I've cropped out the gantry that people were standing on to take the photograph. But if you look at the bottom part of the photograph, you can see that somebody has dropped their beret. Um, <laughs> nice. But they went ahead with the photograph anyways. Um, so we can see the, the crew compartment there, the darker region, uh, and I've put numbers on the different crew positions. So number four there, I'll start, I'll start with four. Four is the driver, 
Uh, and if you look to the left in the photograph, there's kind of a flap which is up, and that's the, the lookout that the driver had to be able to look out through the armor to, to see where he's going. And directly behind the driver is the 17-pounder gun. Um, the one, Number one uh, is the commander's position, and number three is the loaders. They both had these folding chairs that would, right. the bottom, they, would, they were kind of like a, well, the bottom would swing down, but the, the whole seat itself would also come, was like on a metal arm as it would come down. Anyway, and then number two there is the gunner's position. Um, you can also see a bunch of circles in the fighting compartment area, which were the housing for the ammunition. Um, and in the big flat area to the right, we've got all these grills. Uh, the ones on the left are for air intake, and the ones on the right are for uh, outtake, for, for expelling it, the hot air from the engine. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Sorry, I just want to leave it a bit longer so we can take a better look at it. That's all. Sure. Yeah, that's just a great photo and the beret. Yeah, that's funny. Somebody getting in trouble. <laughs> um, I, yeah. Um, initial. Okay. Yeah. So initial development began in September 1942. Um, the prototype took longer to be finished than anticipated. Why I'm not sure. Um, I've, I remember seeing documents that they were expecting it in February, but instead it happened in April or May. That was when they actually tested it. Um, so that's a, that's the prototype there. There are a few minor differences, like um, I mentioned that single that flap that the uh, driver had to look out of. Yeah. Uh, in this version, it's slightly different. There's two flaps. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. but that but that's a prototype there. Cool. Um, uh, sorry, if we just have one quick question because it is a good sure. question. And while it's in our minds, and this mm -hmm. is an excellent point, where does the commander go when the gun is in action? Because you can't. Oh, no, that's the driver. Uh, the driver sits wow. right there. All right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And um, th this is uh, I didn't plan for this in the the presentation, but there was a there's a big there was for quite a while a myth that the driver would be killed by gun recoil. Yeah. Um, this was disproven in the 90s or aughts by David Fletcher, who went and looked at some of the. Uh, crew manuals that are at the tank mm -hmm. museum. And he discovered that there's instructions for the crew for how to operate. Those include stuff like to the com if they need to turn the vehicle so that the gun is aiming more towards where they want to shoot, yeah. the commander is supposed to be able to just tell the, the driver to turn the vehicle right away. Right. Uh, another piece of evidence I found was that, wonderfully, um, there was a, a recording on the IWM website of somebody who crewed one of those he and drove it. He mentioned getting a headache from the gun. So, <laughs> yeah. And then um, the yeah. third part. The third part was actually one of these technical reports where they'd taken note that by the time the archer went into service, there was already rumors that like it was like going to be dangerous for the driver. Yeah. And the base. The answer was basically, well, if the recoil is such a problem, um, then like. Like you're gonna have bigger problems, like probably if the gun's gonna explode or something like that. Um, <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's not gonna. Yes, you're. Yeah, uh, Sheldrake's right. You have to have great faith in the the, re yeah. the hydraulic recoil. Well, and I did. I did find in in my research and I addressed in the book. Uh, one of the Canadian regiments found that they were issued archers with faults, and it, and I found a lot of paper trail, which was quite well. But like, oh, so if there is actually one of, was actually one of these problems. Here's how they here's how they, they investigated and figured right. out the problem. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, um, that's, that's just wild when you actually take a look at it and think about it. But you can't see the depth either, right, from this angle. So yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Okay. Back on track. Right. So um, there were some initial reactions uh, about the gun being mounted backwards, um, and. Because at this point in time, it was pretty clear that the Archer was not going to move as fast as a Cromwell tank. Right. Um, there was a me there's a memo from uh, one of the high up generals uh, about a future design where he wrote, there are tactical reasons which make it desirable that the gun should fire to the front. The price to be paid for this in height of silhouette, in arrangement of space, in outboard length of gun, and in inability, in inability to secure the gun for traveling may not be acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for that future design, he was suggesting that they should design both arrangements and then compare them. 
So, but that does go to show that there were some advantages to fi to pointing the gun backwards. Right. It's not as silly as it might seem, just based on yeah. the surface of yeah. it being backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. Okay. So, however, when they got to doing firing trials, they discovered a serious problem, um, which is that if the gun was if the vehicle was parked on a sufficient slideways slope, there was a problem with the gun traverse, where basically um friction would come into play and the gunner could not turn the wheel to make right. the gun rotate um and uh subsequent meetings like uh somebody suggested let's just put it into production and fix it later and the, the rest of the general staff said no uh <laughs> probably because they had enough trouble with previous tanks that it turned out to have technical problems and so on uh, and so, uh, so a power assist was developed, and that was eventually approved in October 1943. Uh, and basically, when the gunner turned, the, so if you look on the right, um, there's you see two wheels. There's something in front, uh, which is for the gun elevation. Uh, that's the one that is where the wheel is oriented or is vertically. The behind it, there's a horizontal wheel with a handle. Um, and that is hooked up with like a little black box behind it and also a cylinder. Basically, as the gunner rotated the wheel, if the engine, if the mechanism was on, it would provide additional force in the direction that he was turning it. And thus, they could just power through the problem if there was a, a slanting, uh, if there was like a frictional issue. Yeah. Um, and that did well enough. Uh, so, but then as a result of that, because it took until October to approve it, right. It, push production back from January until April of 44. Right. Um, and, oh, no, it was not hydraulic assist. Uh, it was electrical. Um, so okay. now there were a number of concerns raised in the time between when the vehicle was first, you know, sort of demonstrated and when it went to production. Yeah. Um, so first of all, of course, was that really what they wanted was something based off of the Cromwell. As I mentioned before, um, that the Archer was not going to be as fast. The Cromwell was an extremely fast tank, and so it was like, wouldn't it be great if we could get a self-propelled gun based on the Cromwell? But there were two problems. First of all, as I wrote here, there's no design. Second problem is that there was a production bottleneck. Um, right. uh, the Cromwell was powered by the really great Meteor engine, uh, which was derived from the Merlin, I believe, the aircraft engine. Yep. But they could only, the fact, they only had a certain, the, the army only had a certain number of factories mm -hmm allocated basically to produce meteor engines. So if they wanted a Cromwell-based self-propelled gun, they were going to have to give up Cromwell tanks. And when they found out about that, it's like, no, basically, we're, we're you know, we, we can't do that. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. And then, then there were also production doubts. Maybe would they just could cancel the whole program altogether. Because for one thing, December 1943, they finally solved the problem with putting the 17-pounder gun into the M10. And 17, uh, M10 with 17-pounder is shown on the right there. Um, so maybe they don't need it because they've got this. And then the other question is that somebody does a bunch of counting about all these different orders they have for self, a more, more American self-propelled guns and so on. And they said, well, maybe we don't need, we're going to end up with an enormous surplus. We don't need these anymore. Uh, but uh, so there were a number of meetings. But basically, what they decided to do was to just keep the production going in case they needed it. Um, yeah. Even though I should say that, like, they basically declared the Archer obsolete before yeah. it was even put into service. Well, I mean, that, um, that, that just sounds like allied or uh, procurement anyway. It's like, yeah. all right, why not? You know. <laughs> the next slide, please. We've been we've already got to this point, so we might as well just keep going. Yeah. So now we get to Normandy. We land in on D-Day. Uh, we're fighting in Normandy, and uh, we've discovered where the 21st Army Troop discovers that there are problems with the towed 17-pounders. Um, side note: I would say that it's possible that if they'd all been looking a little bit more closely at reports from Eighth Army or 50, 50, well, from Italy, maybe they would have sort of realized, like, oh, hey, uh, there are problems. But I discovered in my research they didn't seem to really talk to each other as much as maybe they could have. No. Anyway, uh, so yes, 17-pounder towed gun. It's large. It's heavy. Uh, I didn't write here, but it's, um, the vehicle that they had for towing it, called a field artillery tractor, was really just not powered enough. Didn't have a big enough, a good enough engine. So it took, um, so it was difficult to move it around. 
then because it was so big, it took a long time to conceal or to get to withdraw. And so the crew was at risk uh, during that time because they're presumably easier to spot them when they're like still camouflaging it or digging a pit for it or whatever. So that was not good. Um, next slide, please. So in the middle of July, the 13th to the 16th, two archers were sent from the UK to Normandy and put on demonstration at a few different locations. And it was viewed very favorably. Um, so I'm just going to read a few quotes from this report from a major Walsh of the School of Anti-Tank Artillery. This equipment was received with great enthusiasm and approbation by everyone who saw it. The 17 pounder Valentine, because that's how it was referred to at the time right. for the most part, impresses people as being a gun, unlike the M10, which with its intercom and confined space really resembles a tank. Hmm. The lack of a top traverse and shooting to the rear were not considered a serious disadvantage since fields of fire are generally narrow and in any case for a quick switch, turning this vehicle on its tracks is quicker than turning the turret of the M10 by hand. Although the general opinion was that the 17-pounder M10 was a better weapon, everyone was fully prepared to accept the 17-pounder Valentine as an SP. The owners of the towed 17-pounders were universal in their opinion that it should replace all towed 17-pounders in all types of regiment. Wow. Yeah. Next slide, please. So um, after the demonstrations, those two archers were sent to the 55th Anti-Tank Regiment, Suffolk Yeomanry, uh, which was in the 49th West Riding Division for a battle trial. Um, I could go into some details about that, but the long and the short of it is they were, they were used to provide some protection for infantry, but they never actually saw real action. Um, and interestingly with these trials though, I mean, they're sent on this trial, but the use of the archer in say 21st Army Group was not contingent on the results of the trial, because even while this was going on, they were making plans to adopt the archer. Okay. Um, so, so in August, we see a bunch of planning being done, uh, but there isn't a date chosen yet for when they're gonna start um, introducing it to service. Um, but they sort of determine a couple of the effects um, that introducing it is gonna require. So for starters, uh, every anti-tank regiment had a light aid attachment of engineers for doing the repairs. And uh, there needed to be a change in organization there, or a change in trainings to have people who were trained on how to work on tracked vehicles and to have all the tools that they would need for that as well. Right. Uh, and uh, the second was that there needed to be more people trained on driving tracked vehicles and on doing the maintenance. Uh, and there was a small unit in 21st Army Group that was had already been set up, but continued to be used for training personnel on the Archer. Um, uh, because I mean, even at, at the 1940s, you know, not everybody even knew how to uh, not everybody even knew how to drive a wheeled vehicle, right? Yep. So, um, so uh, that takes us up to the end of the the Normandy situation, and maybe we could field some questions at this point. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Just I, I my prerogative. I want to ask you a question. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned there that, that this is going to go into use regardless of the field trials. So, yeah. it was the field trials? I think you just kind of answered it there, but I'd like a more in depth answer if that's okay. Of okay, so if we're going to field trial it. Is it just to see literally what it does under combat conditions? Uh, that's a good question. Maybe to see if there were any fatal flaw flaws that should make mm -hmm. them stop it. Um, yeah. it's definitely, uh, there's not a lot of feedback that I've found about these trials in Normandy. There's much more written about the trials in Italy that we're going to talk about next. Right. Um, which I mean, it's somewhat philosophical, but also, um, there's a lot more to chew on about maybe how to, how to deploy them or the value of them or whatever. Yeah, okay, we'll get to that for sure. And that's definitely going to come up later. Um, so this is an interesting question. The, the later version with the tow hook, when does that reach? That is a good question. Um, I think the tow hook was actually issued retroactively, but I'm not sure. But I think okay. possibly at the end of the war, Eric, uh, you'd have to look through the photographs in the book or I'd have to I'd have to go check, <laughs> uh, check to be sure. Uh, yeah, 
while while all of the stuff that I'm talking about here goes on, there were still more technical um, trials being done. Like as as you mentioned, like uh, eventually the archer was given a, a hook at the rear so that it could tow a 17 pounder gun if they needed it, and also a hook type thing also at the front uh, to push a 17 pounder gun into a into a pit if it was needed as well. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and and yeah, they were doing other things like making sure that it could be used if it had to be deployed amphibiously in like a, like another D-Day or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sounds like a death trap. Um, and everyone <laughs> knows I love the DD tanks, but that sounds like a death trap. Uh, good question. Uh, was Vickers Armstrong also making the 17 pounder gun? <sighs> oh, I would have to, I've got some documentation about that now, but I don't remember for sure. They definitely made the mounting for the 17 pounder gun that went into the yeah. trial vehicle. Um, I, I would not be at all surprised, but I'm not quite sure, Ian. Sorry. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me uh, either, given the timeline. Uh, okay, that's a good question, actually. Um, so Alex was asking from the picture, it was the overhead shot, right, with the crew mm. Um, You know, if the hot air could wear the barrel. I know I've seen this come up. Okay. Uh, online. I don't recall that actually being raised as a concern in contemporary documents, actually. Okay. Um, would that have I to do more concerned? I mean, I guess you could call it wear, but more like, I mean, distortion, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's probably you start to curve it or anything like that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, well, it'll come up, but I mean, just how much it was used or wasn't used, especially given the conditions. I mean, it doesn't seem like that would come up, but. You're the expert, not me. <laughs> uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to catch up here. <laughs> One was more of a rhetorical question. <laughs> all about all the stuff being so high profile. I'm not really sure. Ah, here we go. Degrees of traverse and elevation of the gun. Oh, now you're asking me. Uh, 22 <laughs> degrees to each side. Um, Elevation, maximum elevation, 15 degrees, and depression, seven and a half degrees. Okay. Um, I do recall, so one of the, one, I'm not focusing on that in this talk particularly, but a secondary use of the archer, which was quite extensive, was as basically a, an extra field artillery piece yeah. to be used to, to supplement larger barrages. And I well, think I was going to ask there, about that anyway. <laughs> and um, there is a passage of a description of a barrage by, <laughs> The commander of one of the anti-tank regiments in the barrage for Operation Plunder. Yeah, and I part. think I think he talks about ramps being constructed to help increase the elev effective elevation of the guns for some of the archers, so they can be firing at a higher angle and reach further targets. Yeah. Um, so yeah. 15 degrees was like, I guess, as much as was practical. It wasn't as much as like you'd really want, I mean, if it was, you know, with a 25 pounder gun, I'm pretty, I'm sure that 15 degrees would not be sufficient. Um, no. Well, and then there's a question here about um, space, basically for higher elevation without the recoil right. hitting the third floor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory about that one. Sorry, I just missed one here. Mm -hmm. uh, would they not want to do field trials in a less hot sector than Normandy at the time, or was it sent there to be stopgap? I really think it was just, it was to test, I mean, where else would they send it? Um, I mean, I'm not sure. They, not at, this, at, this, at, this, at this point in time, there are already a bunch of archers on their way to Italy, um, but I guess it just took longer. It was a lower priority. Um, and otherwise, I mean, they were fighting in, in, in Normandy, so I don't see where else they could really test it. Yeah, well, it's right across the channel, so it's... Uh, uh... And maybe we'll get to this later, but I want to ask it now. Um, is was the archer equipped with high explosive? Uh, yes, whether that was whether for direct or indirect fire. Yes, um, the amount of high explosive uh, that was carried varied. It was initially fairly small, but I think that increased. Um, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> yep, yep. Based on the things you had me look at. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, one more, and then we'll move on. Uh, uh, why is there a lack of external stowage? 
Well, I mean, I would say it's not. There isn't. There's. There were quite a few, actually, quite a few bins. Um, maybe just not enough for the crew, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. I like. I just don't think there was enough space. Um, and so you will find photographs. What's interesting, actually, is that there's definitely some photographs where you see the crew have strapped enormous amounts of stuff onto the front or the back. Um, but you don't actually, many archers, you don't actually see the degree of stuff strapped on that I've seen on, in tank photographs for some yeah. reason. Yeah. Maybe it, now every, it's true. And maybe this is, maybe, maybe they left more stuff with the wheeled vehicles that were accompanying them. I'm not That's sure. What I thought, yeah. Given the nature of the, the unit itself, um, Anyway, um, yeah. yeah, we got more questions, but we'll save those for the next round. Um, okay. some good points coming up here. But uh, anyway, to the question we just had about that stuff. Or do you want to do, oh, is that the right one? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, so this is, a, because we're going to be talking about a bunch of, of units, I just thought I would give a little explainer yeah. about the layers of anti-tank defense in the British and Canadian armies at this time. So to begin with, you've got infantry divisions and armored divisions. Um, and both of those had uh, a regiment of anti-tank artillery available. Um, and uh, also at the core level, which is above the either of those levels, there's also there would also be one regiment in the core. And the idea behind those was that they were redeployable assets, that uh, elements of the regiment could be assigned to help one part of the division or core or another, and, and they'd have flexibility that way. In addition, with the infantry uh, regiments, um, there was also a, an anti-tank platoon in each regiment. Those had six-pounder guns at this point in time. Um, and then another factor was that the core, particularly the core regiments, tended to have the better equipment. Um, because if you've only got a limited amount of it, you're going to put it at the level to begin with where it has the most flexibility in use. So that wherever you need the best stuff to be, you can put it there. Cool. Want to move up or move on? Yeah, yeah. Here we go. This is the one I was expecting. <laughs> right. Okay. So now we're going to Italy. Um, set in September 1944, um, eight archers were offered and accepted for battle trials there, um, and they arrived uh, 13th and 14th. Well, with the regiments on the 13th and 14th of September, um, with each troop of 93rd Anti Tank Regiment in British Fifth Corps and with G Troop of 7th Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment in 1st Canadian Corps. Um, now, at this point in time, I believe we've just captured Rimini, which you can see in the far southeast corner of the map. Um, and we haven't quite crossed the Mareccia River, which is kind of hard. You can see the name Mareccia at the bottom of the map, uh, and it's kind of <laughs> uh, overlapped with like the road and railroad lines that go from Rimini to the southwest, but it's in along that line. Um, and also a really important uh, road to mention is the one that leads northwest from Rimini to Bologna on the map, although we're not going to get there in this discussion. That's uh, Route 9 or the uh, Emilia Road, um, which basically is the axis of advance for pretty much from this point until the end of the war in this region. And on the right-hand side there, we have an M, kind of a bit hard to see, but that's an M10 of the 93rd Anti-Tank Regiment um, with the uh, Mareccia Valley, I believe, in the background. Uh, and if you look to the skyline there, you can see that there are still some pretty significant slopes in this area of Italy. So it's not the easiest terrain even still, even, even if they're, like, it's not really the mountains either. Yep. Okay, next slide. Okay, so... Um, there was a fair amount of importance placed on the archers arriving in Italy. Um, for one thing, um, there at this point in time, there are no 17-pounder Sherman Fireflies and there are no 17-pounder M10s anywhere in Italy. So the archers are actually the first 17-pounder armored fighting vehicles that arrive. Um, okay. And so a set of so and the other thing is is that the overall silhouette of the archer is not dissimilar to some <laughs> of the German anti self-propelled anti-tank guns. So the 8th Army printed off a set of four different photographs 
of the Archer, or as it says here, 17 pounder anti-tank guns mounted on Valentine chassis and had those distributed to help make sure that people could recognize them as friendly. Uh, and another little element is that uh, General Lease, who was the officer commanding 8th Army, actually ordered that the archers were not to be deployed without informing him. Uh, I don't hear, didn't find anything else about that, but at least he wanted to know that they were going into action. So that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's only speculation, but can you think of why? Uh, well, as you said, they were the first ones. So um, just because it's new. Yeah, basically, I think. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so um, we're going to pick things up here. Uh, just actually, I'm just going to make a little note um, on the so on the so they arrived with 93rd Anti Tank Regiment on the 13th. They found a place to zero the guns um, by firing them out to sea. Uh, so that that's to make sure that the guns are all the guns of the vehicles are aligned properly, and they'll actually shoot where the scope says they're going to shoot. Um, on the 20th of September, um, some allied forces believe they've seen a tiger tank and the archers are ordered up to try and take a shot at it. Um, but they don't manage to see anything once they arrive and they get subjected to some mortar fire and somebody gets injured. Um, mm -hmm. but nothing more, nothing more happens than that. Uh, then on the night of the 22nd to the 23rd of September, um, the Gurkha, 43rd Gurkha Brigade, which is the 1st Armored Division, I think, um, crossed the Marechia River there and take a ridge. Uh, and then they did that because that, well, Allied intelligence indicated that the Germans had withdrawn from the Marechia and they weren't going to defend it. So this was something that was thought that was going to be safe to do. Allied intelligence was wrong. So the Gurkhas, so the next day, the Gurkhas had a really tough fight. It was very touch and go. And there were a lot of losses. It was bad. Um, and then that following night, the archers get told about midnight that they should be ready to go up at dawn uh, to protect a flank. And so uh, by six o'clock on the 24th, they're there ready to protect to, to protect the flank against further German counterattacks. But the Germans decide to fall back. Um, you know, they are obviously, you know, they're very good about sort of looking at the temple of things and deciding when to cut their losses and continue to fall back. As we all know. Yeah, well, that defines yeah. Italy. For uh, that. And Sorry, this is just a funny point from, from Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's a joke, but I could literally see that, those words being used. That's, and this is like almost prescient. Um, uh, that's funny. So, uh, so now the advance uh, gets uh, switches from the armored division to 56 London division, the Black Cats. Um, so in the morning of the 27th, they're heading towards the Salto River. So they've made it most of the way from the, from Santa Arcangelo there to the Salto. Um, and the commander of the anti-tank regiment of this division come to the anti-tank gunners uh, with the archers and say, uh, you've been ordered to come up to support uh, the second Royal Tanks on the who are on the right side of the advance. Uh, and... The battery commander with the archers is not very happy about this because he feels the, the 93rd have definite opinions. <laughs> They've been using the, the M10 since January, and so far as I can tell, they think it's just the bee's knees. Um, mm, right. So, and well, what was written in the in the diary was that surely, like, basically, the archer is not suitable for this job. So then they go to the brigade commander to see can they get the orders changed? No, they cannot. Um, a real factor seems to have been. Uh, tiger fever or Mark VI 17-pounder fever yeah. uh, that the gunners really um, maybe, I don't know if it was, you could say they had an inferiority complex, but that they they really wanted those 17-pounders up there supporting them in case there were tigers. And we know that the 504th so the company, heavy tank company of tigers was operating in the area. So it was not like an empty threat really. Um so they don't, they're not able to get out of this duty, and so the, the archers go uh, into service there. Um, now, noon the next day, uh, the battery commander wants to withdraw the archers for some maintenance because they've actually been in operation for a little while. And at that point in time, when the tank 
commanders find out, or tank commander, I guess, finds out that all of the 17-pounder self-propelled guns are going to be withdrawn from the front, there's this enormous uproar. Like, no, you can't do that, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, and so they have to agree on a compromise where they switch some of the vehicles around so that they form two troops with two archers and one M10 in each. And they're going to allow one of those groups to fall back for a couple of days to do maintenance, and then they're mm. going to swap. So it's like the, the the tank crews really, or commander really did not want that. However, at that point in time, it starts to really pour with rain. Uh, and that so to begin with, that complicates the, the plan for maintenance because they wanted to withdraw back behind a river barrier to be safer. They couldn't do that. But the bigger impact was that the... I can get the pronunciation of this wrong. Fiumicino River basically doubles in size and yep. makes it impossible for the Allies to advance for two weeks. Um, and in this time, uh, the uh, 93rd Anti-Tank Regiment start to receive some M10Cs, that is like the M10s with 17-pounders. Um, and eventually they're going to give their archers to the Canadians, but those archers are not going to have trained in time to see active service in October, which we're going to be talking about next. So next slide. Okay, so um, in the meantime, since the 14th of September, so almost a, well, it's been a couple of weeks, uh, and almost a month by the time these river waters are going to subside, uh, the Canadians have been training with their archers. Um, not long after they get the archers, they send three crew members from the Light A detachment to a British tank troops workshop. I speculate that this workshop must have had people in it who were uh, experienced from North Africa. So they, these three people are yeah. sent there to learn about Valentine tanks. Right. I can't imagine that they had any Valentine tanks on hand, but they must have been able to get some training uh, because then they, they come back after a couple of days and pass on what they've learned to the crews of the archers. Um, hmm. So there's that knowledge transfer that's going on. Yeah, that would make um, perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it takes them strangely, it takes the uh, the regiment a long time to find some place where they can actually do this zeroing of the guns, and finally do that on the 12th. Um, on, in the meantime, um, last effort for the moment by 56th Division is that on 10th of October, they're able to form a bridgehead on the far side of the river, opposite Savignano, uh, and then 1st Canadian Infantry Division takes over the advance from them. Uh, so we Canadians push forward with good progress. Um, and on the 16th, the archers and also a troop of four M10s are sent forward to provide some infantry support. Uh, now we're heading towards Chasina, which is larger than these other settlements. Uh, and the assumption was that the Germans were going to actually defend it uh, from within because right. it's an urban environment and they can make that hell as they've done uh, in any number of other locations. However, um, on the 18th, I think, no, the, uh, they get a, they get an order from above that uh, Castle Ring has allowed them to withdraw. Mm -hmm. And so on the 19th, the Canadians actually, during the day, the Canadians actually find they've lost contact with the Germans because the, Ger the Germans are falling back quickly. Uh, and so then the Canadians are able to press on. And so by that evening, uh, we've got Canadian infantry, namely the Carlton and Yorks, on the outskirts of Chasina. Uh, now, at this point, uh, I'm going to uh, do a reading from my book about what happened next. Yeah. Um, right. So, um, so the, the, the so the plan for Chasina, if the Germans were going to defend it, was actually to encircle it. The Canadians were going to go to the northeast of the town. The British to the southwest of the town. They were going to, or maybe I should say city, they were going to both cross the river on those respective sides. Then once on the other side, they could link up behind Chasina, and then the town would be cut off, and any defenders in there would be surrounded. Um, but the Germans forestalled them by pulling everybody out ahead of time. So on the morning of the 19th, um, they send patrols in the Car Carlton and Yorks, and also on the British side, the 16th Durham Light Infantry send patrols in. They don't find Germans, only cheering Italians. Um, however, the Germans are still on the far side of the river, and they've got defensive positions there. Now, I should add at this point that the Carlton and Yorks are accompanied by 
B Troop of 1st Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment with some six-pounders, commanded by a Lieutenant Martin, and also the G Troop Archers. And they're commanded by Lieutenant Parr. Um, so that day, that's the 20th, the Carlton New York spend the whole day securing their sector and looking for anywhere they can cross the river, but they find out that the Germans have, in fact, blown up all the bridges. Uh, in the afternoon of the next day, the 21st, 1st Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment Headquarters realized the fact that an aerial observation plane, one of the little uh, monoplanes, uh, had spotted German tanks on the other side of the river. So the two lieutenants go to see if there's a place from which they could fire on those tanks. However, it was raining pretty heavily, and it was making it hard to see. There was not much cover, and the area they were investigating was being hit by mortars and artillery about every five minutes. Neither officer felt it was possible to put a gun into action there and then to get it out safely. On a separate occasion, the Carlton and Yorks also act, act, asked the archers to engage an enemy anti-tank gun, which their forward platoon had spotted across the river. Um, sorry, next slide, please. Right, okay. Uh, so a Sergeant Harrison uh, reconnoitered three possible gun positions while under heavy shell fire, but ultimately, uh, I don't imagine it was the Carlton Yorks, but somebody denied the anti-tank gunners permission to shoot because the infantry were afraid that the Germans were going to bring down a big barrage on them in retaliation. Yeah. Um, so these are two really great photos of one of the Canadian archers, and I just thought we could sort of pause and take a look at these here. Um, the uh, supposition, th there's no record really, I can't prove that the archers were actually firing at the situation, but it does really appear that the this road was threatened by German small arms or machine gun fire. Mm -hmm. You can see that the cameraman and the first photograph is on the far side of the road from uh, the archer, and there's that fellow running across, and the next photograph, the cameraman has joined them over there. Um, we can also see how um, the crew have like tied some things to their archer because I guess they don't fit into the provided storage bins. And amusingly enough, you can see in the far side of the right photograph, there is some sort of a wizard doll or something, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of traditional doll with a tall pointed hat that they've strapped to their archer for good luck. <laughs> yeah, like a wizard or a gnome. I see that guy has a mustache. Anyway. I can't yeah. imagine it's really a gnome. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So at, after this point, um, the Canadians managed to make a small bridgehead across the river uh, north of the city, uh, and they and subject it to multiple German counterattacks, uh, and things are not good. And they try to establish a second bridgehead, and that gets repulsed. Um, so at that point in time, the Canadian efforts are sort of put on hold for a bit because the British have had more success in their sector in getting across. And s the assumption then is that the Germ once the, you know as the British uh, lodgement expands, the Germans are going to fall back from the river again. Um, and then finally, when they do do so, the archers are held in res as an anti-tank reserve, and while the Canadians are advancing, the archers don't see any more action. Um, and then uh, every, the whole, all believe the Canadian division uh, goes into reserve, and the yeah. Canadian archers spend November basically just doing training. Yeah, um, that like kicks in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I had to be kind of a tone <laughs> wizard. If I thought, <laughs> oh, if only we could go back and get more photographs. It's a oh, really good question. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next slide. So we have some interesting reports. Uh, am I allowed to like a historical digression? Yeah, of course. Okay. So this comes from one of a series of reports. This is sort of like the original reason I started to do these document swaps. Um, there was a sub-organization of the Ministry of Supply, that sounds very technical, called AFVT, uh, Armored Fighting Vehicle Technical. Yeah. Their responsibility was to gather information about fighting vehicles from the troops, whether it was technical reports or uh, any kind of reports, basically, and to report those back. Um, these documents don't seem to have survived completely in the British archives, yeah. um, and, but we've got multiple complete sets of them the Library and Archives Canada. Uh, I, from a historiograph historiographical point of view, I don't think these have really generally been incorporated into books that are getting have been published about 
British uh, armored fighting vehicles. And right. so there's there's a there's a bit of a lack and there's a bit of an opportunity for the future for people to um, thank you, Susan. Uh, <laughs> for people to, for people like there's probably yeah you know there's probably like uh, some like PhD theses in this for, or, or um, something like that and and some room for for improved books in the future. Yeah, sorry, um, just this is a complete digression as well, but it's the same sort of thing. There yeah, yeah. are not available in Britain, but are at Library and Archives Canada complete uh, intelligence reports from late 1941. I don't know why that would be interesting to people, but uh, they are available there. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Anyway, reports. From okay. Canada. So, so one of these reports from from the Mediterranean area provides some really interesting commentary about the archer and the rear mounting gun. Uh, so I'm just going to read here. Yeah. Gun, gun positions are selected for the usual reasons, field of fire, concealment, etc., and allotted to each gun. The guns, now in this case, they must mean M10s, do not, however, remain in these positions for the whole of the time of waiting, but retire down a reverse slope some hundred yards or so to the rear, so behind a hill. When a target is sighted, the guns advance as quickly as possible to their gun positions and engage. It is a great disadvantage to have to make this move in reverse, and the alternative of coming up in a forward gear and then swinging through 180 degrees on the position is not favored. Um, the same report also does like give a concession, and this is like it's an interesting kind of a military cultural issue. It can be stated from all those we spoke to uh, that all those those we spoke to were unanimous in their desire not to become tanks and very conscious of the existence of the slippery slope which may lead them to such an end. Their difficulty is that they do not see how we, they are to avoid acceptance of tank roles without laying themselves open, open to charges of being uncooperative or worse. If, for instance, a section of guns is lying up in a prepared defensive position and the infantry report that a tiger has appeared on some adjoining sector where it is known there are no anti-tank guns to engage him, it is also almost impossible for the anti-tank gunner to resist the request to go and get the tiger which is a dangerous thing that they didn't want to have to yeah. uh, deal with, like in the sense of the anti-tank gunner's role was to ambush effectively, yeah. Yeah. not to go and directly engage enemy armor. Yep. Uh, for this reason and for this alone, a section of opinion is definitely favorable to the arrangement whereby the gun fires over the tail. It is obvious, even to the technically uneducated, that such a machine is not suitable for tiger hunts. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so the, um, there's a real attention in the Royal Artillery or, and Royal Canadian Artillery about, like, we're gunners. We fight guns from, like, we use our guns in prepared positions and so on. We don't want to be the Royal Tank Corps. Uh, and so they're finding themselves in this slightly nebulous situation. Um, however... Uh, there's another report from a major of the Department of Tank Design. He also went to Italy, uh, and he talked with 60th Anti-Tank Regiment and 7th Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment. And because of that, and the fact that the post-war history of the 93rd uh, was very negative about the Archer, but more briefly, I'm pretty sure the preceding, the, the stuff that I just read came from 93rd Anti-Tank Regiment, that first unit that had Archers, and put them into, into action like within a week of getting them. Okay, so this major's report uh, stated that the archer had been extremely well received because one, archer can be reversed into position normally at leisure speed, but is able to draw out quickly to a free position if counter battery retaliation is too heavy or an alternative position found necessary. Two, commanders are not invited to use archer as a tank due to its firing rearwards only. So, um, so to those people, and apparently the Canadian regiment, um, Archer was fine. Uh, and yeah. what's interesting there is that, as I've discovered, the M10s were given to these regiments and without a lot of instruction about how they were to be used. Instead, the basic idea was that the regiments were going to use them and figure out best practices and develop those. And then that was going to percolate upwards and then get collected into actual like a doctrinal handbook that could be issued. And that didn't happen for the M10 until January 1945. So you can see how the 93rd, had kind of, they come up with their own practice. They're going to keep the M10s behind the hill 
and then they get given the archer and well this doesn't correspond with like the tactics we've developed for ourselves right yeah makes perfect sense yeah Cool. Uh, so I think this might be another good point to take some questions. Oh, sure. Uh, just let me work our way back here. Uh, we did that one. Da -da 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 -da. Sorry, one second. Uh, well, this is an interesting question. Was the archer, why was the archer with the 25 pounder considered a failure? <laughs> yeah, there's I've, there's like one or two photographs of an archer apparently with a 25 pounder gun fitted into it. Um, I don't know. I haven't been able to find any actual documentation about it that I can recall. Um, I suspect that the maximum elevation was not very high. Um, mm -hmm. There was, like Eric must know about the Bishop, which was another vehicle, another modification of the Valentine uh, to ho house a 25 pounder in a big box, basically. Mm -hmm. And it also had the problem where the gun couldn't elevate enough and they had to build up slope sometimes so that the gun had a high enough elevation to to shoot a long distance yeah, um so yeah i don't really know that the archer with a 25 pounder might have been something that they mocked up for to try vickers armstrong might have mocked up to try and drum up foreign sales uh and nobody bought um i don't know good question another kind of weird out there type of thing but as a lot of us know the, the soviets love the valentine mm -hmm. Were there any, I don't know, was there any consideration of even giving to them? Do they even know about it? Uh, I have not seen anything to indicate they know about it or that they were offered any. Um, because the Archer production only started in April of 44, by the time that they then decided, like, okay, yes, we want it, part of the timing behind when it started to get issued in, in numbers would have been... Um, like how many had actually been produced and were was there enough to sort yeah. of equip regiments on a universal basis right. so i don't think that they were actually probably offered the archer probably not um sorry uh, yeah. so i know there's none at the Kenny war museum is and i think no there isn't i've, I've it, heard a rumor that we might borrow one from the dutch and that would be wonderful but there are no none. archers in canada none at all okay and no, not, not in the museum in Saskatchewan, manitoba uh, the artillery museum there, no. The Shiloh, yeah, Manitoba. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and but there's one at Bobbington uh, currently. Yes, yes. I didn't know that. We're all learning things, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Oh, and this is excellent. And going with OTD, uh, <laughs> memory, yes. mythology, uh becoming the favorite thingy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is uh, this is a good one. It's going to come up because Dharma focuses on variable, but. Uh, I'll just let you read that one. <laughs> this is really interesting, Dermot. Uh, I do not know about this Directorate of Tactical Investigation. That sounds really interesting. Um, no, I haven't. I haven't had a look at those. Um, please contact me uh, <laughs> via World War II Talk if you've got stuff about archers. I'm I'm still interested to find out anything else I can. Well, I have both of your emails. We can link up later. Yeah. Um, yeah. If both parties are interested. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, there was one more. No, that's great. Uh, oh, we got to a point. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm just reading. All the yeah. Uh, no, I think that's. Uh, oh, okay. Um, what is the tank kill record of the archer? How's it compare? Uh, yeah, compare proportionally. I honestly, I don't have the numbers. Yeah. Um, I would say it's not really that high, and but it's a difficult thing to measure. Uh, what what you would really need, <laughs> you'd, you'd you'd really need something like you'd need statistics for the M10 and Hellcat for the same time period that the Archer was deployed, and do mm. calculations per regiment probably because like the m10 was deployed far earlier and i suppose the hellcat too i don't remember when the hellcat was deployed you know the m10 was deployed far earlier than the archer so definitely in terms of gross numbers the m10 scored much higher and the other thing is is that in the period ironically when the period that the archer was deployed uh the german tankers are like the germans had were running out of tanks right 
Which makes sense. So that's a great irony, right? I mean, yeah. the, the Archer was designed in mid-1942 when, you know, the British have had all these recent reverses in North Africa. Um, and so it's really not clear what the sort of dynamics of the war are going to be. And 1945 is really different. Uh, I see Sheldrake is anticipating the next thing we're going to talk about. Okay, good. We'll move on then. Yeah, Sorry, I'm just yeah. trying to catch up here. Sorry, just asking about where there's ones on display in the Netherlands. And I've been to one of those museums and now I feel bad for not going looking at it. Maybe I did. I don't remember. That was a busy trip. Uh, anyway, let's move on. We can do questions at the yeah. end. Sounds sure. good. Okay, so in Northwest Europe, the decision was made to adopt the Archer for the anti-tank regiments and infantry divisions. So it didn't affect the armored divisions. I can't remember the number of actual armored divisions in 21st Army Group. Sorry, somebody will somebody will remember better um, than me. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, and I'm uh, there's a few details that I've kind of left out of this. For instance, I know that 52nd Division, um, the Lowland. Lowlanders, they had a slightly different arrangement for their anti-tank regiment, and I haven't included that here. But the fundamentals is that in, say, October 1944, before any of the archers are adopted, um, you've got five infantry divisions uh, that are, their anti-tank regiments are two-thirds six-pounders and one-third 17-pounders, except we've got four assault divisions, the ones that landed on D-Day in Normandy, and they've got M10s instead of their 17-pounders. So as a result of this adoption, those four regiments have to turn in their M10s, um, which didn't, none of them admittedly had the 17-pounder gun. Uh, and they had to turn those in, and they had to accept archers. And the conversion process is sort of gra like gradual for different regiments. And the first wave is complete by uh, January 1945. Uh, so we've got now nine divisions. Uh, they've turned in some of their six-pounders and collected archers. So overall, the like number of heavy guns in these divisions has gone up, and right. also the number of high mobile mobility vehicles, basically. Yeah. Um, and then there's a further uh, adoption, so that by April 1945, almost all of the regiments, uh, except for that fifth, no, except for one, but that's beside the point. They they you can see that they switch over, so they turn in more six pounders and as i recall and one of the regiment one of the batteries becomes all archers right uh i and there's a side note it's interesting that some of the the regiments decided that this official arrangement was not really what they wanted and they kind of did things their own way but <laughs> well, you like, know. okay it's like really you're just going to do things differently that's uh, interesting um no the as i mentioned the Four these four assault divisions had to turn in their M10s. Generally, they were unhappy. Three of the four, I think, tried to get the change stopped. Uh, <laughs> and Third Canadian, the 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 regiment in Third Canadian Infantry Division, Third Canadian, which Third Canadian Infantry Regiment, they didn't complain. But there's a note about how the crews are becoming a little more enthusiastic about their new equipment. So you know they. Were on hat. They were, you know, kind of sad or unhappy about about switching their gear. Yeah, not surprised. Uh, yeah, know. yeah. Uh, and there's a quote from from one of these like more formal complaints. From this was from 102nd Anti Tank Regiment. A high proportion of the kills by the M10 were quicker opportunity targets, which would have been missed by the more cumbersome Valentine, which must move backwards into action. Um, I mean, and that may be true. Probably is true. I'm not okay. here to. I'm not here to say that the archer was better than the M10, but that it did a useful and interesting job. Uh, it's worth studying. Well, that can be your conclusion in your next book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go to the. Oh, you've already gone to the next slide. So, yeah. So now we're we're on to Veritable. Um, so Operation Veritable, um, very briefly, was designed uh, to clear the to push the Germans out of the area opposite. Um, First Canadian Army uh, to drive the Germans off to the other side of the Rhine. It was supposed to coincide with Operation Grenade by the Americans, but because of flooding, the Americans were not able to cross over. And uh, so then the Germans were able to put all of their reserves into resisting uh, British and Canadian forces. Um, it started on February 8th with a gigantic artillery barrage. Um, 
and I mean, we've pro people particularly who who watched your channel will probably have seen this map, right? Um, uh, very like very briefly, kind of some of the major objectives in the first part were to take the town of Cleve uh, in the north and the town of Goch, Goch, Goch uh, in, in the in further south. Uh, so, um, but for, we're just gonna look at a little slice of this. We're gonna follow 51st Highland Division who are operating in the southernmost area. Um, and for the most part, not in the horrible forests that the Welsh had to deal with and so on. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so um, in the upper right-hand corner there, uh, we've actually got a still from a video that was taken before the battle. This is one of the 51st Highland Division archers with, I think, some men from 5th Black Watch uh, before the battle started. Um, and then this map here below, taken from my book, um, kind of shows the area in question and the locations of importance when we're looking at archers. Um, so the division's objective was to capture the southwest corner of the Reichswald, which is basically in the northwest corner of that map. Um, uh, and then they were supposed to secure the road to Goch. How do you say it anyway? I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah, I'll anyway. So, so okay. the, the, this road was important as a supply route. And so it comes yeah. down from the, the northwest there, passes by the town of Gennep, then go, goes northeast to Hekens, and then southeast through several other towns to get to Goch. Um, so the first objective then after the Reichswald was to capture Gennep because although the road um, is on the opposite side of the river, basically, uh, if the Germans control Gennep, they can shell the road and so on. And then, you know, clearly that's not going to be any good for supplies. Um, another side effect of capturing Gennep and the air, that area there was the 8th Corps is waiting on the far side of the, the river to the west there. And once that area is safe, they can build a bridge and send in more troops and supplies there. Um, next slide. So um, our map on the left, um, right. So, okay. So on the second day, so it's February 9th, uh, while the other two brigades are in the forest, 153rd Brigade is he head south towards Gennep with 5th Black Watch in the lead. Uh, the archers are, are with them and are used to fire on enemy held houses and town uh, and machine guns uh, to you know smooth the way. Uh, and by 3 p.m. they've captured Cowns Camp, which is the village that I've circled in red in the upper left hand corner. And you can see Gennep in the lower right there. Um, so then the next day, uh, the 5th, 7th Gordons take over uh, the advance and they tr around the middle of the afternoon, they try to capture the bridge uh, sending a patrol to see if they can capture the bridge. Um, but when the patrol gets about halfway from that main road to the bridge, the Germans blow it up and start blasting them with machine guns. Um, and, and at this point, uh, hang on, uh, shoot, I haven't got, I haven't got the passage to hand right now, but an archer commander, uh, Arthur Vuzden, uh, just drives his archer into the open field or into the open anyways, turns around and starts firing at the machine gun post with a 17 pounder. Um, and between that and eventually a smoke screen that gets laid down by the 25 pounders, that's what takes all of that in order to get the, um, the patrol back to safety. Um, so the division has been stymied in seizing the bridge, but, or the brigade, I should say, but they knew that it was like really not very likely to happen. So you see the little bridge marker on the map there in black in the middle, uh, that night, they cro um, forces cross the river in assault boats, and then the next day, or that night, they enter the town, and so the next day, there's a, a big, fierce battle to take the town, um, which is successful. Um, okay, so now I, I do need to read from my book, so if you'll just give me one moment. Yep, no problem. Okay. Um... Okay, so from the 12th to the 14th of February, um, the brigade is fighting to expand the bridgehead again up against fierce resistance. 
On the 12th of February, the 1st Gordons and the 5th, 7th Gordons push south with artillery support. 1st Gordons seizes the village of Hayen, while 5th, 7th takes ground to the northeast of the village. So that's what you can see in the map on the right. Hayen is in the, the red circle um, at the bottom, and the 5th, 7th Gordons are in the to the northeast there, and there's a forest kind of in between the two. And the forest is still occupied by the Germans. So around 3.30 in the afternoon on the 13th, uh, D Company of 5th, 7th Gordons send an urgent call for armored support. They do not have tank support here. Um, there is There are Churchill tanks assigned to the division, but they're not in this area at this time just yet. Um, so the Gordons can see three German self-propelled guns and about 80 infantry forming up in the forest to make an attack. Um, so they do call in some 25 pounder artillery fire, which disrupts the Germans. But 15 minutes later, G Troop of Archers arrives to help finish the job. So of Lieutenant James Robert Cuthbertson immediately proceeded to carry out an extensive reconnaissance on foot, all the time exposed to enemy fire. When he discovered the position of a German self-propelled gun, he returned to his troop and led a gun forward to a position from which it could engage the enemy. He remained with the self-propelled gun in an exposed position, directing its fire until the enemy gun was put out of action and he was satisfied that no other guns were in the vicinity. By stalking the enemy guns and using his self-propelled gun as a tank hunter, he no, no doubt deterred the enemy from launching a counterattack on that position. Uh, his coolness and disregard for his personal safety while carrying out a self-imposed but extremely unpleasant operation showed courage of a very high standard, which was reflected in the men he led during this action. Uh, and around the same time, the Germans also attack the first Gordons in the south, and uh, but they also get defeated. And again, the archers contribute to the defense by knocking out a self-propelled gun. Um, so next slide. So I'm going to, looking at the time here, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Sure. Um, so over the next bunch of days, basically, uh, the main force of the division take Hackens, and then they manage to cross the river and capture Cassell, although moments are kind of touch and go. And then um, I should say touch and go until forces from the other bridgehead at Gennep link up with them. Uh, then they push all push on to Asperden and then get uh, close to Gok. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah. 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 So Gauch is divided by a river, uh, which you can kind of see curving th through there. There's sort of a more industrial area um, on the north side of the river. And because the bridges are either assumed that they're going to be blown up or have already been blown up, I'm a little, I can't remember for sure. Uh, there are separate operations for each. So like mm -hmm. 15th Scottish Division is the main force that's going to be responsible for capturing the north side, while the Highlanders are going to capture the south side. Now, is it possible for you to play that video? No, I don't think so. Oh, what a shame. Okay. Let me on your uh, end, I believe. If you can try it on your end, but I don't, I don't know. Oh, okay. End. Let's see. Yeah, I don't think I can do. No, I can't do anything. No. Oh, what a shame. Okay. So that's just a little clip. So those are archers that are participating in the barrage of Gauch, um, in what it gets, gets referred to as a pepper pot, it's in the pepper. sense that. Uh, if you're going to be doing a barrage, you're basically going to throw everything in the kitchen sink into the barrage. So it would be like heavy mach Vickers machine guns, archers, uh, mortars, anything that makes a noise and can inflict some like like fear or whatever, uh, or keep the Germans' heads down. Heads down. Um, yeah. Right. So okay, too bad about that. But that's is it is it is it a, a, a IWM? Sorry? Is it Imperial War Museum footage? I somehow must have clipped it from a video at some point. So I had it. I, I'm yes, it does come from it. You can, you, I think you can see the footage. If nothing else, there's a um, was an actual propaganda video released to the public called "Gosh Grabbed," and I believe it is in that video. Okay, I'll uh, see if I can some, find it afterwards and link it. Some of it anyway. Yeah. Um, okay, so on the 18th of February, both on the north and the south sides of the, the river, um, the divisions begin their attacks. Um, although on the the 15th start earlier in the day and the 18th, the 51st start in the evening. Um, so, um, 
One second here. Okay, so once again, this is just, you know, twist of fate or whatever. 153rd Brigade are again given the job of capturing the town. So we're talking about the same brigade as before. Um, so at 9 p.m., 5th Block Watch launched their attack, and they reached the northwest edge of the town at 2 in the morning. And then they find there's really little opposition, so they're ordered to continue to the main square of the town, and they get there by 5 a.m. Now, from the German perspective, this is really bad because all of a sudden these Scots have arrived. I don't know why the defenses weren't differently set up. Anyway, um, so this is very threatening to them. So they focus all their artillery and mortars there, basically. Mm -hmm. So at dawn, 5th, 7th Gordons try to pass through the 5th Black Watch, but they run into such heavy fire and there's so much rubble in the streets that they really can't bring up any tanks. And so their progress is minimal. Um, so it's really looking like an impossible job, basically. Um, so the Scots, the, these Highlanders decide, okay, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, so on dawn on the 20th, they start an operation. I think we can, okay, just, no, we don't have to go to the next slide yet. But if you look at the, at the map on the left, right at the bottom, there's a circle for a place called Thomashoff, which yep. is a farming complex. Yep. Um, so the, the general idea is the 51st Highland Division are going to send forces around, to wheel around the south side of Goch and cut it off from the rest of the German forces and supplies. And then, you know, the defenders are going to be cut off and it'll be, should be relatively easy for them to be captured. Um, the fighting at Thomashoff is much uh, worse than expected. There's a lot of defense uh, and it takes until 4 p.m. for them to capture it. However, they do capture it. And so then it's possible for the next phase so the 7th Black Watch are going to move around the outskirts of the town, and the 5th Black Watch are going to like uh, execute a wider wheel at a greater distance from the town and thus cover their right flank. So at 9 p.m., um, 5th Black Watch head out, and they've got the archers of one of the batteries in support. Um, I guess we can go to the next slide now. Right. Okay. So Thomas off there is Thomas off is on the left there. Uh, so their objective is this farmstead called Slovenian and the buildings nearby. Uh, taking these buildings is going to put the regiment close to the railway and the road, which leads to the town of Wies. So it's going to make it difficult for the Germans to send in any supplies or reinforcements that way. Um, so they ha did have a little artillery barrage and followed close behind it and take their first objectives. But there are German paratroopers defending the area. There's a counterattack, and, and they're slowed. But at 2,300 hours, A Company was able to attack Slovenian. Uh, you could, I think it, it's marked A there. It is. Um, but they only managed to take some of the farm buildings. And for a while, there's a continued fight. Uh, finally, though, D Company is then ordered up. And they capture an is isolated house with some trenches, um, which you can see also marked on the map. Uh, and around midnight, German armored fighting vehicles are heard, possibly driving north along that road into Goch. Uh, and so even though these positions are not really very secure, the archers are called up for, to provide support. Quote, great difficulties were experienced with getting vehicles up the track we advanced along. One self-propelled gun slipped into the ditch, and the track was blocked and impassable to anything except a carefully driven jeep. The self-propelled guns were got forward to companies before 100 hours, but ammunition had to be carried forward as all carriers were stuck. Um, in the meantime, 7th Black Watch are making some progress, but they get held up in a large building, and the Germans there have got some armored cars and some self-propelled guns. Eventually, some of those had... So, you know, speculation or, or not, it's possible that those were the vehicles that 5th Black Watch had heard. And then some of those vehicles turn and head south, and whether it was intentional or not, they drive into that D Company area. Quote, around 0500 hours, a runner from D Company reported two enemy self-propelled guns were only 50 yards from the company, having moved in from the rear and were pumping shells into the company, which was being counterattacked. An enemy SP had come, that self-propelled gun, had come from behind and was thought to be friendly for some reason. It fired at our SP, partially disabling it at 40 yards, fired a few more rounds and went off. Another followed and was knocked out by a Piet. Yay, Piets. Um, so the D companies, they've still got their ground, but this archer is not in a good situation. Um, and But the sergeant who's commanding it, William York, um, is able to basically urge the crew on. So I should note, it was hit twice. It's immobilized. The engine compartment is broken open and the gun was jammed. 
but they managed to unjam it and get it clear for action. And so in the morning, uh, when uh, to the south or southeast on the road, near the road, um, the infantry see a Mark IV tank and several self-propelled guns, and the archer is able to knock out the tank and one of the self-propelled guns, and then the remaining armor heads south. Um, so they were able to defuse that situation. Right. Um, and then basically there are, it is seen that there's more infantry that are forming up, but they're able to then call on more field artillery um, and drive them away with losses. And then basically the, um, that day, uh, the other forces are able to complete the encirclement of Goch and the defenses of the city crumble. Um, so that, that concludes the story of 51st Highland Division in Veritable. Cool. Um, shall we go on to talk about the Gokalka Road then? Uh, if you want to do it real quick, if that's possible. <laughs> oh, well, we maybe, okay, maybe we should just stop it there then. Yeah, we um, can end it there. Um, maybe I'm having you back for another time to talk about that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. No, that's quite all right. Can, can you advance to slide 35? Yes, I should. Just real quick. Yeah, great. So, um, archers are later used in the liberate by Canadians liberating the Netherlands. The, the photo on the left there is one taken from this town of Meppel. Uh, and you can see there's not just Canadian soldiers, but also civilians riding in it as the archers drive through town because I think the Germans have left like an hour earlier. Uh, and then on the right, that's again a Canadian archer, and that's like a send off parade basically. Um, the archers are going to be turned in after that. Um, and next slide. Yes. Yeah, I never timed this presentation, I must confess. No, 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 no worries. Yeah. Um, so I just thought it would be a good idea to have some, to discuss some final thoughts about the archer from the end of the war. Uh, obviously, the rear-mounted gun um, was not, you know, ideal. Um, well, yeah. So there's a, but, so um, here's a quote again from one of those AFVT reports. Most units equipped with these vehicles like them and state that their performance has, on the whole, been quite satisfactory. The only serious criticisms by most units are that the vehicle is, is too slow to keep up with convoys, so the Valentine was never fast, uh, and that the gun is mounted so, so as to fire over the rear of the vehicle. This necessitates turning, possibly in, in view of the enemy, when coming into action. So again, this reflects the difference between, you know, sort of how they expected the archer to be used, which is basically get up into a defensive position and then just sit there versus what we find uh, British and Canadian forces actually doing um, in 1945, which is a lot more on the offense uh, right. than in 42. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, um, there was a preference for M10s expressed by those four uh, assault divisions. And I think the 102nd, again, are kind of, again, not really happy with the archer at the end of the war, right. um, but they're basically there just basically was not there was not a sufficient supply of M10s to provide them to all of these infantry divisions. So it was really a question of archers or nothing, basically. And so putting the archers into the mix allowed for more of these anti-tank guns to be motorized and um, capable of you know more mobile action. Um, and then, so, and, and yeah, and then the, the alternative was towed. And so I just want to close with another Canadian quote from yeah. Lieutenant Colonel McMillan of 3rd Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment after the fighting, including plunder, I guess. During the fighting in the month of March, one lesson was well learned by the regiment. That is that self-propelled anti-tank equipment is far superior to towed anti-tank guns at any role, end yeah. quote. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah, we're arguing with that. Thanks, Chris. Uh, if you got time for a few questions, that would be uh, absolutely stupendous. Sorry, one second. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, well, and Dermot just makes a good point. Um, but uh, yeah, you guys should talk at some point because uh, that's his focus is veritable. So yeah, yeah, I've talked with Dermot before. Oh, perfect. Uh, well, then, Dermot, then you need to look up look up Stolpe's threads. Then I'll um, then I'll shut up. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, well, people want you back, so we'll figure something out to talk about. Oh, that's very kind. The action uh, on the on the Calcar or the Gok Gok mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. Calcar Road. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, moving on here. Uh, Canadian Army give their archers to the Dutch. Um, uh, the so far as I can tell, the Canadians basically gave back all their archers to the British. Yeah, that's um, and the British gave some donated some archers <laughs> to the Dutch, 
and they tried them out and decided not to adopt them. Um, but mm -hmm. that's how we get a couple of archers in. I guess they kept them because like they had been used in the Liberation or whatever. That's how we end up with a couple in in Dutch museums. Yeah, that happens with so much kit. It's, uh... So many good museums there because of that. Anyway, yeah. um, and maybe this could be post-war. I don't know how much you look into that. Yeah. But so Arthur sent to Southeast Asia. Yeah. Yes, and there were there were also lots of technical preparations to like, oh, we we want to use these in tropical conditions. Um, so yeah, a few were sent. Um, refer to my book. They did. They did not. They didn't see any action. Okay. Uh, dun, 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 dun. When was the Urcher discontinued? You said 55. Uh, were they mm. in Korea? Uh, so, I mean, potentially it could have been used in Korea, but none were sent. Um, they weren't. The okay. short of it. Well, this should be an easy question to answer. Chris, are you the Urcher guy for World War II? Talk? Yes, I am. Chris C. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Terry said something in there like, we had a guy who just came up with a new book on the Urcher. I'm like, <laughs> well, that's, yeah. that's the guy we're talking to right now. Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, all right. Did oh, okay. That's a good one too. Actually, did the yes. Archer units use late model Valentines? As, uh, yes, yes. The 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 term used, which is amusing in the in the regimental, well, not even just the regimental histories, is officers charger, and it, okay. which is weird. But you have to think a replacement for a horse, yeah. right? I mean, this is ridiculous, right? Yeah. But that was the term they used. Um, but yes, and I found in the Canadian records that at least the Canadians were arguing for using Valentines instead of Crusaders, because okay. it would put the the vehicles would then be sharing the same spare yeah. parts, engines and everything, uh, and the Valentine was more reliable than the Crusader. Right. So that's, yeah. so if you've done any scale models and you or if you've seen photographs of these Valentine tanks that are still plugging along in 1945, it's because of that. Uh, well, although they were also given to some of the other uh, field artillery regiments as well. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Especially with the Lady detachments, they wanted as much uh, similarities as possible. Yeah. Right. Uh, da -da -da. Oh, it just moved. Uh, how did the Egyptians end up with some? <laughs> um, the long and the short of it, uh, in a brief window of time, um, the British sold about 200 of them to the Egyptians. This was before Sinai, obviously. I would, I would, I would imagine before Suez, yes. Yeah, before yeah, before Suez, and I and before the arms deal with Czechoslovakia, right? Um, right. Which really, when they bought a bunch of Russian equipment, and and that really, you know, signaled a big shift. Um, <laughs> yeah, things changed there. And and yeah, as I describe in my book, actually, Egyptian archers were used in a fairly major battle in 1956. Uh, that oh, was wow. okay. really surprising to me. Well, I'll have to buy the book to find out about that one. <laughs> yeah, so uh, awesome. Thanks, Chris. Finally glad to get this book finished. Like I already said, we last hung out. Um, glad to yeah. see it. Um, glad to have you on here to talk about it. And it uh, looks like we're going to have to have you back because like uh, like Dermot, I'm obsessed with Veritable. So I want to talk more about <laughs> Veritable and Blockbuster in any way. Yeah, that would, that would I'd definitely be interested. We could talk more about um, the archer's use in like the supplementing the field artillery yeah, uh and we can talk more about more about canadian use um the, yeah, the sad yeah. the sad thing about not being able to to share the stuff about the got called car road is that we've got uh two post-war recollections of the engagement actually written by canadian soldiers well, so don't anymore because we'll use it for the next one yeah yeah <laughs> well uh but yeah, maybe we can push through to the end because some of those the chapters I edited for you, the other one stuff, it's stuck in my brain. So it must have, uh, it's interesting if it's sticking in there with the amount of stuff I read. Um, yeah, and yeah. Susan, our always voice of wants an archer tour, just <laughs> 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 for everything. So um, uh, I, I, yeah. I still haven't gone on any like battlefield tours, and I'm, I'm definitely having thoughts about, I mean, not necessarily an archer tour, but like. <laughs> You know, going to some of the places which coincidentally were also where the troops were using archers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just a great, I love going to that area, the veritable area and blockbuster area mm -hmm. regardless. So it was a great area to travel in. So, anyway. cool. So, yeah. So great stuff. So, other than that, uh, yeah. Thanks, Chris, for coming on again. Appreciate it. We'll figure something out to get you back on at some point. Sure. You, know, you are working on another book. So, we'll leave that as well. I don't want to bring mm -hmm. that. I was going to talk about it. We're out of time. So, leave another yeah, yeah. hanger. Uh, I, can I just yeah. say, yeah. Uh, thanks to everybody for attending and watching. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. It's great to have everybody. The sidebar is super knowledgeable, um, especially when it comes to this anti-tank, tank destroyer. I don't want to start that debate thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't.
what he's braver than me for taking that on. Um, but yeah, so it's great to have the sidebar and everyone and all the supporters on Patreon and here on YouTube. So keep an eye out. Uh, come stuff coming up in early March. Uh, I've got some stuff I'd probably have to move around. But uh, other than that, uh, if you can support me through Patreon or YouTube, that'd be great. Uh, and uh, I'll see you everybody next time and enjoy the rest of your uh, weekend. Long weekend for some of us. So uh, enjoy that while you got it. All right. See everybody next time. Okay. Bye for now.